Welcome everyone. I'm uh, Sally Tallent. I'm the director of the Queen's Museum and I'm so excited to introduce this conversation between Hank Willis Thomas, Tremaine Emery, moderated by Dr. Amy Raphael. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, there will be a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Please mute yourself unless you're speaking. Um, you can use the chat feature to ask questions and to comment during the presentation. And please note this talk is being recorded. Um, so this talk is part of the Queen's Museum 2021 annual benefit, Give Up the Goods. The benefit is our largest source of unrestricted operating funds. We've made all of the benefit programming free this year, and we hope you'll consider making a donation to the Queen's Museum to support our work by following the link in the chat. Um, over the past year, we've navigated one of the most challenging periods that any of us has ever experienced, not just here at the Queen's Museum, but across the globe. Despite the immense difficulties that we've faced, I'm proud to say we've remained committed and connected with our communities. Since reopening the building in September, we've welcomed over 70,000 visitors to the museum and strengthened our commitment to remaining free and accessible to all. By launching hybrid programming, we found ways to engage with our audiences virtually, whilst ensuring that those with limited internet or no internet access can still participate in our activities offline. And by hosting a cultural food pantry in collaboration with La Jornada since June 2020, for nearly a year now, we have provided fresh produce and art materials to over 32,000 families in Corona, Queens, uh, helping to alleviate the demand on existing relief efforts. We are offering rent-free studio spaces to artists, financial resources to local community partners, and we're working with them over the next year to reimagine the museum as a site of care and a site of joy. We are feeling hopeful. We are feeling excited. Now, just before we begin, I would just like to take a few minutes to acknowledge our relationship to land and to place. Um, as this event is organized by the Queen's Museum, I'll address the specific site where our building is located. Queen's Museum is located in Flushing Meadows Corona Park in Central Queens. We would like to acknowledge the Munse, Lenape, Kanasi, Lakawe, Rockaway, and Matinicot communities as stewards of the land and their past, present, and future generations. As both a museum of art and a historic site built on unceded indigenous lands, Queen's Museum recognizes the continual displacement of native people by the United States and is committed to dismantling the ongoing effects of its colonial legacy. As this talk is taking place virtually, we also acknowledge that Zoom has erected its headquarters in San Jose, California, which is the traditional territory of the Mukwe Ma Olon tribe nation. We are indebted to them as the lands and waters that they steward now support people, pipelines and technologies that carry our communications. We honor and pay respect to the indigenous knowledge bearers that have and continue to live in deep connection to the land. And we invite you all to take action now by devoting time to taking care of the land, whether that means clearing up your local park or donating to an indigenous led advocacy group. Right, finally. Um, Thank you, um, and thank you all for being here. I'm, I'd like to introduce our speakers very briefly and then I'm going to hand over. So first of all, Tremaine Emery is the Queen's Museum's 2021 Give Up the Goods Benefit Creative Director. Born in Atlanta, Georgia and raised in Queens, New York, he's the founder and creative director of Denim Tears. Tremaine is a co-thinker for the Queen's Museum's Year of Uncertainty. And Tremaine, I'm so grateful to you for working with us to shape these amazing conversations and, to, and, and this year's benefit, as well as bringing your energy and brilliance to the museum. And tonight he's joined by his friend and celebrated contemporary artist, Hank Willis Thomas. Hank's work explores themes related to perspective, identity, commodity, media, and popular culture. And he has been exhibited throughout the United States and internationally. Hank, thank you so, so much for being here. We're so excited that you could join us and it's a real pleasure uh, to have you with us. Um, tonight. And tonight's conversation will be moderated by Dr. Amy Raphael, the head of content for the College Art Association. Prior to joining CAA, she worked as the Andrew W. Mellon Interpretation Research Fellow here at the Queen's Museum. Her recent Routledge publication, Art and Merchandise in Keith Haring's Pop Shop, provides a starting point for tonight's conversation. I'd like to thank the Queen's Museum team, especially Ben Strauss, our Director of External Affairs, 
Sydney Gilbert, Development Manager, Harit Takwame, Communications and Digital Content Manager, and Mason Wilson, our Digital Content Producer, for making everything possible. And I'll now hand it all over to Amy and to our guests. And just while the, the slides are being put up, I just wanna take a moment to thank Tremaine for inviting me to participate and a big shout out to the Queen's Museum, uh, which holds a really special place in my heart. It's great to see some familiar faces again. So how this all started, a few months ago, I reached out to Tremaine after he posted my book on Instagram, which was a big surprise. We, we connected over the phone and ended up talking for about two hours on everything from art merchandising, the art market and activism. And he said that the book really spoke to him even 30 years later and to what he was doing with his life, which amongst many things includes his collaboration with the Queen's Museum to help fundraise for its mission and also designing merchandise. So he dreamed up this panel to explore those types of issues, which intersects with Hank's career in several important ways as well. So generally, my book is a, a monograph of, uh, and it argues that his pop shop was a culmination of his strong drive to make art accessible to everyone. So it was open from 1986 to 2005 in downtown New York. It sold affordable mass produced items that anyone could buy. And basically I argue that even though the shop was pretty much widely criticized as being too commercial, even though he sold uh, works in galleries for thousands of dollars, it was actually probably one of his most important lasting legacies. Um, more specific to this conversation, the book really looks at how merchandise and consumer culture can shape and build identity. And this is what I think Tremaine connected to. And he was particularly drawn to my chapter on activism. So Herring promoted social change by using existing systems within popular culture, like merchandise, so putting messages on buttons and t-shirts. And he also used his celebrity in the public realm to promote messages that were important to him. So he took on a lot of different issues in the 80s, like children's education, nuclear war, the crack epidemic, and the AIDS epidemic. And his merchandise could raise awareness and put those messages out on the street. So Herring was perhaps one of the first artist celebrity activists, preceded by many celebrities in Hollywood and in the music industry and in fashion. But since the 80s, more and more artists and creatives are working outside of the gallery to uh, present their work and also to enact social and political change. Particularly the two artists that are here today, <laughs> the creatives that are here today. So I start but by opening up the conversation, having that kind of foundation of what inspired this panel to ask both of you, what do you think the role of the artist has changed since the 80s and how has it evolved in, in both of your, in your work and career generally? Tremaine? Um, I think um, what is in something that your book um, really drilled home, something I'd already been feeling, was that um, the highest purpose of an artist isn't to sell work for a bunch of money or receive validation from um, awards and stuff like that is to contextualize the human condition and remind and help us act on, act on, act, think about, educate and act on things that are going on in the world. That's the, I think the highest purpose of the artist. And, um, you know, you wrote many, there's several chapters in that book and that's the most meaningful one. And um, not just meaningful in the way you wrote it, but also I can see in Keith's words, cause you know, you quoted his diaries, you quoted people around him. And, um, you know, and also it showed me how like in the time that he was doing activism, people kind of shied away from him because they felt like him being involved in AIDS charities and activism and other activism, apartheid, that having a celebrity or someone kind of lessens something, you know? And um, 
he still dealt with that and carried that albatross. And um, now I think we see, um, you know, it's a beautiful thing. And, you know, it's part of what made me think of Hank. Um, I'm forever indebted to Hank for letting me be, participate in the billboard. Um, all the billboards that he had um, around America that we got to speak about what art, artists speak about the ills or things they want to speak about society. You know, my particular billboard, which was one of many great ones. I'm not saying mine was great. I'm just saying there was loads of great billboards. And I got to speak about, I, I wrote a free associative Instagram poem, post, rap about the red, black, and green rock in um, Jamaica, Queens that I walk by every day. And um, I got to put a picture of that rock and those words on a billboard on Hollywood Boulevard. And I think maybe one or two people, or maybe a bunch of people, I don't know, that are from my neighborhood that maybe feel like nobody cares outside the neighborhood or maybe Tremaine disappeared or whatever that what we've gone through, what we've lost, what we've felt, what we've gained, what we have, what's our glories, our pain um, is matters. And, um, you know, just a lot of the stuff Hank does, uh, it's just so powerful and um, really meaningful to me before I got to get to know him and we got to work together on, um, you know, trying to get more people to vote um, in this last election. Um, been a big uh, admirer of his work. And, um, you know, they say don't meet your idols, but he was he was a good idol to meet. And um, he's been so supportive um, and figurative and esoteric way to me, you know, like even like, um, he sent me this basketball, the All Lives Matter basketball. And I was just like, yo, thank you so much. I love it. And he was just like, I can't wait to see yours, which is one of the most supportive things anyone's ever said to me uh, as far as like a kind of, you know, more established figure than myself was not just saying, oh, thanks, thanks that you like it. He's like, you're going to do one too. And I can't wait to that moment that you see one. And that's, I think that's the one best thing you could do as someone who has space is to not just give space, which he has done with me and uh, many other artists, but also just tell someone that they can have space. Because if you could give someone space, but if they don't think it or believe it, they won't do anything with the space that you offer them. And uh, yeah, so when I read your book, Hank is an artist I thought about a lot um, that's in the vein of activism and um, art art multiples. And, uh, maybe, maybe we can go back and talk about like Anchor. So one collaboration that you guys did together that Hank was involved was your Converse shoe. And with Hank's background, I think it could help if maybe we can describe that project for people who might not be aware of it and the, the symbolism and the, and the imagery that was used in it and what that means. Mason, can you go back yeah. a slide? Yeah. And Hank, did you have any response to all of that? <laughs> yeah, well, first of all, it's just really great to be here and really um, yeah, it's nice to see you all and, and some of my former uh, mentors. I saw at least Mark Jenkinson um, and, you know, um, in the midst of the pandemic, um, still being able to breathe is um, something that we should all be grateful for. And uh, a lot of people have done a lot of work who are unsung uh, and unknown to allow us or to support our breath, not just through the pandemic, but as we know, for a lot of people who look like me and Tremaine, the, 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 the call for the ability to breathe um, is even more potent in the recent years than before. Um, and I, when I think about artists from the 80s and I think about Keith Haring especially, um, I'm, I, I, one of the inspirations for Four Freedoms, which is the project that um, Tremaine collaborated with and then collaborated with again, um, was one of the inspirations was ACT UP. And it was um, Grand Fury uh, because mm -hmm. I, a lot of the artists in the 80s who took the role of civic leaders when the government and even the president 
had fallen short of their responsibilities in, in another public health crisis. Um, artists stood up and made sure their voices and the stories of those who were dying um, were being heard. And today, be largely because of their work and the work of many scientists and everyone else, um, but led in many ways by artists, um, that uh, while AIDS and HIV are still um, threatening lives all over the world, it's something that um, not only is everyone aware of, but there are people who are now living um, healthy, strong lives, um, even while um, being infected. So I realized through that um, work is that what we do as creatives, and I, and I spoke to Tremaine about that, and I'm so proud of his collaboration with Converse and David Hammonds, um, because uh, he really understands the alchemy, uh, much like David Hammonds, of like opening not only doors, but opening minds to new ways of approaching uh, creativity as applies to the market, but also to, as applies to the community. And so um, I'm taking notes and uh, very much inspired. So thanks for being here. So, thanks for inviting me and thanks for all for your work, Amy. Yeah, so a great start. I think so the converse, for those who might not know who David Hammonds is, he's a contemporary artist who redesigned Marcus Garvey's flag. Uh, I think it was uh, first introduced in the 1930s uh, and it's the Pan-African flag meant to rec recommend black uh, experience. And David Hammonds made an African-American flag where he took the same colors and, and made it with the US design. Uh, and so why, Tremaine, why did you, uh-oh, Tremaine, so why did you, <laughs> so what, how, how did you land on this? And if you could like relate it to the rock that you were talking about uh, in your hometown, what it means to you and having yeah. it on shoe, like what does that mean? Um, so yeah, it started with the rock just, Moved to Jamaica, Queens when I was about nine, 10 years old. And driving or walking in and out of that neighborhood, you had to pass by that rock. And then, you know, I seen LL sit on a rock and a Hey Lover music video with Boys the Men, a couple of other videos, you know. That rock is the first time I saw those colors. And um, I, I believe maybe my parents or someone explained to me what those colors mean. And then um, I remember searching out uh, the store called Nubian on um, West 8th Street. And I keep going back because they're always sold out of the red, black, and green wristband. This is in 1998 or something. It was down the street from Electric Ladies uh, Studio and Gray's Papayas. Anyway, so I, that's how long I've just been into those colors, what they aesthetically and what they mean. And then um, I'd say maybe 10 years later, I saw this flag. I didn't know it was David Hammond's at first. I'd see it on tumblers. Probably first time I saw that flag was on a tumbler or something like that. Because um, probably for most of my adult life, the only black artist I knew about was uh, Basquiat. You know, I learned about Basquiat from my friend Rudolph Philogene, who's a Haitian kid that lived next door to me. And he was very proud to be Haitian. He told me the greatest artist is a Haitian, Haitian, Haitian by the name of Basquiat when I was, we were like teenagers. And I didn't know any other black people made art um, that was celebrated by museums or anything like that. Um, I remember going to museums and not seeing any black artists. Um, and then, you know, Basquiat in 2003 had a show at um, the Brooklyn Museum. And I used to walk around with his book. I remember I traveled down south for the summer with it. My family was like, this is chicken scratch. This is an art. And I was just so proud of Basquiat. And then, I start uh, going to more museums, um, start dating a girl and friends with a girl and dating a girl who, Hadara, who put me on to a lot of art that led me down a lot of different pathways. And um, one of those pathways was David Hammonds. Um, I learned more about him from my friend A-Side um, and um, Virgil and our talks about him and we'd like have group chats talking about him and sharing his artwork. And then, um, you know, so I started becoming obsessed with his work. 
and um, buying up all the books I could and learning as much as I could about him. And then um, Converse, a guy named by the name of Daryl Jackson, nicknamed Curtains, reached out to me about a year and said, hey, would you like to do a shoe with Converse? Um, um, we're doing a thing with three Black artists, Shaniqua Jarvis, who's an amazing artist in herself, um, Chris Union, and we want to do you. I would do, I'm like, no one respects that I'm on vacation. Anyway, um, and then um, I did, a, <laughs> and um, I was like, I want to do, I want to put the black gaze on the American flag converse. Because those are my, those were my favorite converse, American flag converse. Even when I wear, I never really wear my own clothing. When I wear my sneakers, the David Hammond's one on my right foot. And, and um, that's how I wear mine. And, um, you know, went back and forth with Converse on and legal, this and the third, and like, you can do it. And I got it approved. And then um, I worked kind of tirelessly for almost two years trying to get in touch with David. And I finally got in touch with David. And um, because for me, I'm, I'm, I'm not perfect human being, but I'm a principal guy. And if David would have told me he, would, he didn't want his shoes, his flag on um, the Converse, I would have deaded it. But um, we spoke, I think it was 2020, July 30th. I think it was the day after my birthday. And um, David called me and said, hey, what's going on with these tennis shoes? <laughs> and it, and um, he, I said, um, I'm doing these shoes and um, I'm donating the money to Black Voters Matters. Um, and I want, I just want people to know about your art. And I want to be a bridge between your art and the young generation. And then we talked some more about, he's like, well, do you feel like it's plagiarism? And I said, no, Mr. Hammonds, I feel like it's like when you started out and you were inspired by Eve Klein with your um, your um body print paintings and you inspired by Eve Klein print paintings. And he said, oh, that's different. And I said, I hear you. And I said, well, I don't think it's plagiarism. And I said, hey, Mr. Hammond, since George Floyd's death, your flag's become a banner for Black people. And um, I see it on Instagram and all the time, and it means a lot to people. And I just want to connect all the dots through these sneakers. And I just want to make, you know, the purpose of Denim Tears, the art I make right now, and the brand is to make help Black people feel great about who they are and where they came from, the good things and the bad things. And um, I just want to get- is emblematic of that. And um, he said, go ahead. So I was just going to say, go so ahead. the project became a lot more than just shoes and that there's all these initiatives and that's how you started working with Hank. I thought I could go back to what Hank was saying about the four freedoms and the use of these billboards yeah. and this idea of being influenced by ACT UP and other artists in the 80s who put messages out on on billboards. Uh, and how, how did this project get started, Hank? And what was the impetus? And where is it? Is it still ongoing? Like it's, if you could describe kind of the scope, cause it's like, it's huge uh, what you've been able to accomplish. Well, thank you. Well, uh, which project? <laughs> <laughs> well, the Four Freedoms, I guess it's like hundreds of projects. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the, well, Four Freedoms started in 2015, 2016 as a um, super PAC with the goal of trying to put critical discourse into political discourse through fine art thinking. And um, the idea was that we could um, try, we could attempt to put questions, which is what great, we say great art asks questions and great design answers them. And the quality of the questions impacts the quality of the answers. Um, and much, and so what we um, have done over the past four years is collaborate um, with artists and um, museums um, and done exhibitions, town halls and billboards in all 50 states and all of the uh, territories um, you working with thousands of artists to share their information, but of uh, what, um, and in 2020, it was, it was a huge, 
um, uh, I feel like a, a inflection point, you know, uh, for many reasons. And uh, when Tremaine um, invited us to collaborate with Converse, I want to get out the vote campaign in seven states where there was wheat pasting and, and digital, um, uh, what do you call it, um, engagement, <laughs> um, as well as, you know, using the, the, the sneakers as kind of a call um, to kind of community in a way, uh, or call it, call it into the game, so to speak. Um, we were able to kind of do something different, but over that, we also did, uh, collaborations with Times Square Arts Alliance. And we launched a, 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 an initiative called the Wide Awakes with a lot of other organizations where uh, we tried to um, inspire civic joy and civic play uh, instead of just civic duty. Um, I also have behind me the rock, Liberty Rock. That, yeah, the rock that Tremaine was talking about. Uh, <laughs> Looks like those lines. And so that so that journey has always been kind of, uh, yeah, so it, it, this, I, I just also loved hearing uh, Jermaine talk about how he David Hammond's David Hammond's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. David did what David does. Yeah. Uh, but one thing I've noticed about your work, Pink, is that, you know, yeah. I feel like there's been a shift in the last five or six years or so. So much of your previous work was in the gallery, photo photograph based, sculpture based. And then it feels like you're doing much more collaborative work, much more interactive work. Uh, and and work that goes in the public sphere. This was mentioned earlier, the All Lives Matter. Um, I'm kind of interested, if you want to stop here really quickly, how this started and if this was, was this your first entry into to making merchandise with your work? This is based off of, um, uh, was it originally the New York cover? Uh, I, mean, I think it existed as like, uh, a an idea for a while when yeah. um, maybe the, I don't remember if it was New York or the Billboard first, um, but I've always from my very first show shows made T-shirts and merchandise. Um, never been smart enough to figure out how to sell them well. <laughs> um, <because laughs> I, in a way, I, I, I've been so interested in kind of just the idea of people wearing art, um, and now I think part of what I've been really inspired by when talking to Jermaine is like understanding the currency of the collectible and the, an item that like is uh, exchanged well, um, you know, to the masses and how people can kind of tap into um, uh, uh, and, and maybe reflect and grow um, an idea through their embracing of, of certain merchandise that has certain kind of pointers. Uh, but yeah, All Lives Matter for me, uh, uh, the, on the, the billboard in the middle was actually in 2018 in um, St. Louis, Missouri. So really close to Ferguson uh, where um, that uh, term kind of really took off after the murder of Michael Brown. Um, and the term that being all lives matter in, as a counter to uh, Black Lives Matter. And I realized that in between the lines of uh, that statement of all lives matter was this kind of, uh, cause of course all lives matter, but a lot of people who were saying it actually didn't mean it. And you know, they meant all lives matter, but some more than others. And so I thought that if, uh, if there was a way to read between the lines, you could just remove that V and it kind of tells a different story. And that's kind of a lot of what happens in my work where I'm trying to um, talk about multiple things at once, but with a, a hopefully a sh subtle shift or slight shift. Yeah, it kind of reminds me, um, I wanna kind of, uh, before maybe talk about this in a second, but your other kind of collaborative work in search of the truth kind of deals with this atmosphere of misinformation and lies uh, that's become, so I thought maybe we could land here. I thought this was a really interesting comparison. They both deal with black, identity and black experience. Both of those things I think play such a huge part in both of your careers, obviously. Uh, and I thought maybe you guys could speak speak to, to this and maybe Tremaine can talk a little bit about his collaboration with Levi's and Den Denim Tears and how did you find the symbolism and what does it what does it mean to you? Um 
Uh, I found this symbolism on Kara Walker's Instagram 2000 and like 17. She posted a cheeky photo of like a, a Christmas wreath, but it was a cotton Christmas wreath. And she wrote, Merry Christmas. Like you could hear the caption, like Merry Christmas, you know, and uh, it was tongue in cheek. And I like I liked that type of stuff. And I went on Amazon and I saw you can buy cotton reefs. And so I bought one and I just moved to LA. Um, my old job moved me to LA. And I was in this empty house and all I had was a couch and a cotton reef. And I had the cotton reef sitting in the, um, in the, in the fireplace and I'd come home from work and I'd fall asleep on that couch, wake up and see that cotton reef. And the funny thing about inanimate objects, and I don't believe in like, I'm not a spiritual, super spirit, spirit person, but I do believe inanimate object that means enough to you, it will start speaking to you in a way, esoteric way. And um, I'm really into Joseph Campbell and watching his talks of the power of myth, he said the word religion originates from the word, originates from the word religio, which is means to return to, which is the circle. And, and I was like, this circle of cotton is like, we return to the beginning of America, the beginning of us in America, the story. And I'm like, this is gonna be my iconography for Denim Tears, one of the main pillars of it. And um, there's, there's several pillars of the iconography of Denim Tears currently, and the cotton reef is one of them. And so um, I started working in and I created those cotton reefs about Amazon have like processed cotton. So I start found a way to make the cotton reefs with real cotton, raw cotton. And um, I began making art pieces with it and also created graphic identity with it. And so when Levi's reached out to me, um, shout out to Hector who reached out and they said, we want to do a collab with you possibly. And I just sent them a picture of a cotton reef I said, this is my collab. That was my mood board. One, two pictures of a cotton field and um, cotton reef. And I went to, went to San Francisco and I said, this is what I wanna do. I wanna put this pattern that means this about slavery and reparations and who built America. And I wanna put it on jeans and tell the story in this way. And then, um, then it began to grow when I got really educated by the amazing people who did the 1619 project. And I saw that, uh, my launching of Denim Tears coincided with the 400th year anniversary of um, the first slave ship coming to America. And I listened to that whole project. I read it almost as much as I could of it. And it, it fortified what I was doing already. It fortified this iconography I've been working on for a few years. And then, um, then the, 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 the um, crescendo, which I, the masterpiece of it all was talking to my grandmothers who both of their first jobs was um, picking, rest in peace to my own, my Nana, who died in October, uh, age 93. I'm smiling because she had a great life. Um, she... well, I, just, well, I wanted to say that I, so your website, Denim Tears, it's kind of like yes. your about page is to, you talking to your two grandmas. And I think it's the best about page I've ever seen on a website ever. Because it's just, it just really like speaks to all of the context and all of the inspiration that are kind of poured into this one bowl that are on these clothes. Yeah, um, thank you. I appreciate that. And, you know, my dad and my mom, you know, their first jobs were picking cotton. Every one of my, my dad, so when I told my dad about this project, he said, Tremaine, you're the first generation of Emory's not to pick cotton as a first job. My dad was first job picking cotton at age seven on a, on a, um, on a farm, you know, because they have the kids pick it. And this obviously this is post-slavery because you don't have to bend over and you could pick the cotton faster and fill up the bag. And, um, you know, my grandmas did it, picked it. And um, I just wanted to hear what they had to say about it. I didn't know where it would go, unscripted. And I learned uh, much as I taught all the years I spent with them, the 39 years I spent with them, I learned so much in, the, in those talks. And, um, I'm happy I have that transcript and that, and that's that's the that's the message behind did tears and the, that iconography, pretty much. 
Yeah, I think so. Hank, your work I know is informed a lot by archives, archival material, looking into the past, looking at ads. This is one of your more famous, well known series, Branded. And I also like with your mother, Deborah Willis, the Schoenberg Center, and just growing up with archives and how, what is the message you're trying to get across in this work? Um, well, again, great story. Thank you. Um, I always loved football, um, never that good at it, but. Um, enjoy playing it or watching it play from the sidelines. <laughs> um, um, for most of my life, I also, um, my family, my father's family is from South Carolina um, and uh, spent more time, I think on tobacco field than cotton field, but um, the legacy of cotton in our history has been something that's been kind of resonant for me um, throughout all of my work. I think one of my first jobs actually was as a docent at the National Museum of American History. And we had like a, a facsimile of the original cotton gin and we would like show people kind of about the ingenuity of the cotton gin, which really was, um, it was designed by Eli Whitney, but it was really with this new machine and new technology that the cotton trade in the United States exploded and so, same with the wealth, uh, which also meant the uh, exploitation of, and of labor of people of African descent and the kidnapping of them also exploded around the same time. And I thought a lot about how um, cotton <laughs> is the fabric of our lives, which is what, you know, they're, they're amalgamating. <laughs> Uh, you know, that was their, their, their framework. And um, I thought that had specific resonance for African-Americans. And I started to think a lot about how a lot of colleges and universities, um, especially in the South, but also in the North, um, were either built by slaves and, or were plantations. And how uh, the descendants of many of those slaves are now to this day working for free on the same fields as athletes that their ancestors uh, labored on. Um, and one of the main reasons for that is the selling of merchandise, which is cotton. Um, and so I really, and so I started, looked at the, the, the three point stance and there was a, a photograph of, did by Danny Lyon of, of uh, Angola state prisoners picking cotton. Um, and I saw this uncanny kind of relationship and wanted to represent that in this image called the Cotton Bowl. Yeah, another reason I kind of like this comparison because it kind of shows that consumerism is a double-edged sword and that there's productive ways to use it to build identity, to tell stories, to collaborate, to raise awareness, but it also is a, a system that can be used to exploit and has a real history of violence. If we can go to the next slide, these are some other uh, works by Hank that I think really get to this idea of the black bodies as products, right? As being, um, and that kind of, so with your work, you take existing ads and then you, take away information to then reveal certain truths. Uh, and I wonder, you know, what are the two, how can consumerism, popular culture and advertising build and reinforce identity? How can it build it? How can it take it down? And I think maybe these are some of your most powerful images, especially I think the Nike issues on the left or on the right. Uh, they're also probably some of your most famous images as well. How do you think they factor into this conversation? Uh, like what is producing merchandise? What is this idea of like going into the belly of, of the that has exploited black bodies for so long? Or Jermaine, if you have any thoughts? Oh yeah. Um, 
I mean, again, I think the first time I saw this work by Hank was on Tumblrs. You know, it was like puppies. These all this stuff was super popular in the mid to you know, post it being made was in, on Tumblrs. That's the first time I saw it. I didn't know Hank made it, um, and um, part of my ignorance back then. And um, you know, you see that me for me when I was you know I was in. Um, uh, however old I was then in 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, once I saw this image, I knew, I knew exactly what he was hitting on. You know, you know, like just that thing, man, that thing, like we're, what we're held it for is almost, it's like golden handcuffs. We love Michael Jordan. We love Kobe. We love Shaq. We love Emmett Smith. We love Floyd Mayweather. We love Ali. But that's seen as our, like, the highest thing as a Black person. And, the, and it's all things that we're commodified. And in the end, you know, like, you look at the NFL, the guys who own the, own the teams are called owners. They're owners. They own the team. They own the jerseys. They own the players. If they're paying Kobe $30 million a year, how much money are they really making? So then scale to scale, what she, you know? So it's just like, and growing up in the hood, cats wanted to play ball or make music, you know? And I didn't, part of the reason why I didn't know what I know about art now, it wasn't, I didn't know any artists. Why wasn't there no artists in Jamaica, Queens? Why didn't I know I could go to school for studio art? Why did I know that? Well, Hank, Hank brought up, when you, you guys had a previous conversation that was posted on the website Black Discourse, and Hank, you brought up how the lack of, of Black Americans in politics and why that is. And that kind of relates. But it also reminds me of the work by David Hammond's Higher Aspiration, which oh, yeah. super Higher long goal. poles with basketball hoops at the top. Like it's this impossible dream that everyone shoots for. Yes. I also, I think I wanted to cede my time to Michael Brown for a moment because we called Michael Brown into the room and Michael Brown is here. And I wanted to ask a question about what it, how it feels to carry a name that has a very different weight today than it was when you were born. Mm. You know, it's interesting that um, I, it's, it's, thank you for inviting me in. Um, it's interesting that you asked that. I remember uh, when everything first went, went down with, with that Michael Brown. I remember a friend reached out to me, shot me a text to, to make sure I was okay. So he reached out to me before I think I actually knew what had happened. Um, so I think in that moment, it resonated with me. Um, it, it obviously resonated with me, um, but I guess I'll just say that I have a delayed re reaction to a lot of things. Like I, I think uh, it's probably, not completely different from maybe a lot of us here. Um, but for me, like it takes me a long time to, to process, I think, um, serious subject matter, um, a lot of um, emotions and stuff like that. So um, I think now in this conversation that we're having in this very moment, it, it resonates with me differently, um, but, but I'll stop rambling. I'm, I'm, but thank you. I appreciate you uh, allowing me to a moment to talk. I don't think you're rambling. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw your name. I was like, oh, I got it. I, 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 uh, that's, well, no, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, don't apologize. I, I wanted to say that like, I didn't even get through maybe like a fourth of my questions. And I know we'll probably go over a little late because we started a little late. But I wanted to also open it up to anyone else who want to put their questions in the chat for Tremaine or Hank um, for anything we've talked about or haven't talked about. We barely scratched the surface, I feel. Also, also I'll say another thing about this. Last thing I say about this series by Hank, this series makes me think about every time I've been in a bar and someone asks me, are you Ricky Waters? Are you an athlete? I can't tell you since, since, my thighs got big and my calves got big and my shoulders got broad. 
how many times I've been asked if I was a professional athlete. I can't, I don't, I've never been asked if I'm an artist or a lawyer or a doctor. I've been traveled the world as an artist, as a creative art director. And I've just been asked if I'm an athlete or a musician. That's what I see when I see this, the branding, the branding of a black man branded by society, that that's what we can be. That's what we are, that's our worth. When there's only 300, it's not even just about there's only 300 spots in the NBA, but just about what, what do you see when you see me? You know, and, uh, that's what, that's the main thing I see when I see this, it's an amazing piece of work. Yeah, when in fact, I mean, GQ said that you're behind every cool thing that's ever happened in the last <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're a pretty big deal. Um, a... Like Corey Spencer has a question. Oh. oh, yeah, yeah, I do actually. Um, can you guys hear me? All right. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Hi, um, yeah, I'm gonna hold. Well, now I can. You're on mute. Oh, okay. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Let me let me refer to my notes real quick. Actually, I wrote these down. Um. Okay, so yeah, Jermaine, actually, I want to ask, you know, how do you yourself kind of navigate like that intersection between, you know, the capitalist notion of selling product, and at the same time, you're trying to enlighten people, uh, the black experience and like the black diaspora, you know, do you feel as though, when you are selling these clothes, is it hitting the marks for you? Do you feel like people are getting it? Or, you know, kind of, we kind of touched on, is it kind of like this cool, you know, product? Like, you know, I just really want to know how it feels to kind of traverse that. Great question. Thank you for asking. It. Um, and I appreciate all your DMs on the gram. You send uh, thoughtful stuff to me all the time. I appreciate that. Hope to meet, you, you, hope to meet you in person. Um, I call it the late capitalism shuffle. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I've been having this conversation so many, so much with my close friends, my girlfriend, Lulu, just, um, I want every person that wears the denim tier jeans to feel the weight of it. I know they don't, but even if they don't, um, they, um, they're a billboard for something that's meaningful and real. And also um, I'm able to, uh, you know, help out and help out people. I've, I've, raised, I've raised a lot of money and it's not about talking about that, but I've raised a lot of money for charity and also just, you know, I've been able to help out my grandma and, and roll up some money and put it in her, her palm, her hand. Right. And um, so, and, um, you know, my, my, my mom, she died without a passport, never left America. My Nana never left America. She lived in the trailer. If she would have lived another year, I got her out of that trailer, but that ain't the way things went. So that's what it is for me to be able to help my family, do charity, have health insurance, eat de de decent food, and also get these messages out and live in the, um, live in the, sh in the, in the light that people, artists like Keith and Hank and David and Kara and so many artists um, shine where we, we tell stories. That's what I am, I'm a storyteller. Definitely. I, prefer that, I prefer that I prefer that over artists or any other title. I tell stories. Um, the humans been doing that since we was held around fire in a cave. So I just want to keep telling these stories, not just about black stories, but um, the human condition. And um, I hope, you know, if I have a long, long life, I could tell all kinds of stories, stories about women. Um, we tell stories about women who did them tears about every mother counts a charity you should check out about post and prenatal um, difficulties that women have, you know? So that's yeah, my sure. thing. You know? So that's, you know, I make the t-shirt with Tom Sachs. So we, love Tom. So, we, so we can educate people about what women go through, mm -hmm. who, are, who are women are very unseen in many ways. And we can get education about that and get money to them. And my vehicle is design, cool. And um, that's, how I can get a bunch of art multiples out to tell, get a story out and to raise funds. So that's how I, that's how I traverse it. But yeah, I call it the late cast capitalism shuffle. It's a joke, but it's like, you know, we know the ills, you know, I've read Howard Zinn 
people history of the United States um, and Cornel West and all these people and talk about the ills of capitalism and the ills of um, money. And um, it's a dance with the devil for hopefully a greater good. That's right, we all live in capitalism. We can't escape it. So might as well try to subvert it from within maybe. <laughs> and you know, redirect some of that power. Yeah. Oh, I hope you guys any... don't mind. I actually have one more uh, question if, if yeah, I'm allowed. Um, so I was recently watching a talk between uh, Virgil Mahfouz and uh, Arthur Jaffa. And you know, Arthur, he, he kind of touched on something I thought was like really insightful is that, you know, we as, you know, black and brown people, we operate within certain systems that we didn't create, but we necess we we invent things within it. So it's like, you know, Michael Jordan didn't invent basketball or, you know, Miles Davis didn't invent jazz, but he, he added in, you know, like modal music, you know what I'm saying? Michael Jordan, you know, kind of walking on air, you know what I'm saying? But those intellectual properties, they don't have like a tangible value. It seems when it comes from, you know, black people, and, you know, that being said, kind of within the context of the culture, um, I, I find it, you know, a little odd. Like, how do, how do you feel about a lot of these hype culture brands that do push these images and these ideas that we have created? Like, let's say, you know, Supreme putting uh, Malcolm X on like a T-shirt, you know, and but these aren't black owned brands. These aren't but they're black narratives. Like, how do you feel operating within that same kind of culture? Like, do you feel seen within that? Or do you feel like you've kind of just been, you know, uh, added to that sort of arena? Corey, you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> Not saying you need a job or that you want to work for me. You're hired, man. Um, so great, great question because um, I just say one thing. I'm gonna, I want Hank. To, I mean, what Hank has to say too. But I based in them tears. Dino tears is based off. Um, what if Supreme didn't just do one Malcolm X hoodie a year? Mm. What if that was the whole line? A streetwear sportswear brand that's talking about conscious whatever stuff all the time, not just like a couple of times a year, the stuff doesn't sell out, it goes on sale, whatever, right. blah, blah, blah. Um, that performance over there. I, yeah. I, I, I know James Jebbia personally. Mm -hmm. I've shaken his hand and looked in his eyes. His handshake matches his smile. Uh, he when he puts out a Malcolm X um, hoodie, it's because he 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 believes in what Malcolm was about. Um, I know that about James, uh, who's a friendly associate for years. Um, not to defend and not defend Supreme uh, in general. Now, when you say like it's Biggie's birthday and Kiff or someone drops a Biggie t-shirt. That's what you're talking about, Corey. Stuff, all this stuff, the kind of commodification of uh, black artists and cool through brands that aren't owned by black people. That's what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Are you talking about like how like I went into the Ralph WRL store and the sales associate said, add this to your collection. And there's a, a Ralph Lauren pin that was had red, black, and green and had the polo horseman on it. Right. And I, I don't know if Ralph and them hit up Marcus Garvey's family about that. Right, right. I don't, I don't, I, don't I'm, I'm, I have a call coming up with Marcus Garvey's family, but I don't really have to hit them up because they made the flag for me because I am, it is my flag that Marcus made right, for me. Right, right. I think Ralph got to hit up them and think why is he handing out this pen with the RBG flag on it that has a super elitist icon on, icon on top of it which is a person playing polo. I don't know many black people that have can afford to play polo. So you, it's a great question you're asking. And I think that's a strange dance that's happening is um, brands. I don't think Supreme's one of them though, but these okay. brands, and I love Ralph Lauren as an artist, a brand, but all oh, this, you know, it doesn't even have to be Supreme this, like itself, you know, like no, no, it's fine though. Lucy, neighborhood, like my, any, just, any of these brands, no, you know. What I'm but that's just my opinion. Um, I think there is a false solidarity that um maybe in two years, because it's funny, Hank said the whole, hey, can let's talk to Michael Brown because of his name. Mm -hmm. Was Ralph Lauren making an RBNG red, black, and green pen after Michael Brown got killed? 
or after the dude who got choked down in Staten Island, it's because right. everyone was sitting down on their butt and this guy got his neck stepped on for eight minutes and 46 seconds when everyone was out of work. And they were like, oh, black people get treated really bad. <laughs> George Floyd is in a long line of black people that have been killed, decimated as um, Arthur, Arthur Jaffa says, kill one in 10 to keep them in control. Why now is everyone want to put up a pictures and t-shirts and, you know, brand people that this stuff been going on. Where was Ralph and all these people years ago? Right. So that's how I Thank feel you. about it. No, for sure. Thank you for your time, man. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. I think, did you want to respond to that at all? Or I have, I can pose another question from the chat if you like. Sure, I mean, they, I was just fun to listen to, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so someone asked, because we had mentioned John Michael Bastiat, or Jean Michel, and it's kind of an interesting question because in his lifetime, he didn't merchandise his artwork, but after he died, his fame and his popularity was kind of leveraged to almost the point of there's Jean Michel Basquiat merchandise everywhere. So why now? Um, what does that mean? Is that a different? Well, I mean, I think it's rare that an artist's family gets to benefit from um, the work when, especially if it so, becomes so lucrative for collectors, you know. So when someone buys a Basquiat painting for 30 million or $100 million, none of that money goes to the family. And so mm. it's one of the few uh, examples that I know of, of, uh, of a family of black artists who can actually, I mean, a family of a black artist um, who can actually um, build generational wealth and um, tell different stories and, and elevate um, their work and control the narrative um, to the to their own personal beliefs. Uh, you know that's such a uh, it's so, you know we know about the Rauschenberg Foundation and the you know um, Warhol Foundation, but um, I, I'm I'm kind of really thinking a lot when I see Basquiat and where where his work whose home that normally sits in and who benefits from it and kind of the fact that his man, family can license those things and make um, some money to be is like a slight bit of uh, respite, even though I'm not sure if it compensates for having lost their son or brother at 27 years old, uh, partially because he was being exploited by either the country but or the system um, that he devoted his life to. Jermaine, as an artist that you were familiar with since you were a kid. Did you have a response to that as well? Or? Yes, um, great question. Um, I really like Hank's answer. Um, I've read a lot on Basquiat. And by the time of his unfortunate demise, he was broken by his habit and by the people that supported his habit because they benefited from him being in his drug days. and. Um, he was broken by the gallery system and the media and the fame and um, just pain and not having access to the you know things people who are in pain should have access to. Because even you could be famous and rich and still not have access to the things you need for a lot of reasons. And um, I think he thought he'd be forgotten and seen as a joke as a flash in the pan. And obviously it would be much better for him to still be alive and be healthy off the of drugs. But I think, um, again, I don't, I'm, I don't believe in the afterlife, but in some esoteric sense, it's great that um, kids that look like him or don't look like him get to see his artwork because the people that own his artwork, uh, you know, like an example, I don't like the Brooklyn Nets jerseys that have basket thing on it. But I love that kids who love basketball get to see Basquiat's hand style and writing on it. I think those jerseys are whack. But I think that doesn't matter. That's just my taste. That's my opinion. Taste is relative. It doesn't matter. 
what's great is that kids who can't see the basket yet, that's in some rich, probably white person house, probably doesn't spend much time around people of color besides their maids and people that serve them, that there's access for kids to see Basquiat's genius work on a Colin de Garçon t-shirt or a Supreme collab or something like that. So I have to take my cool guy, um, you know, elitist. So there's all types of elitists, you know? There's just like, you know, and I'm elitist in a different way out of it and say it's great that he's being seen around the world, not just in a few museums and rich people homes, yeah. but with the people that he came from. Is he from Brooklyn? And he's Haitian, Haitian, yeah, Puerto you, Rican. When you buy something and you wear it, it feels like you can own a piece of it. You're projecting that message. Uh, unfortunately, so we're running out of time. I just wanted to end with showing the, the merchandise that Tremaine designed for Community Day, which is part of his uh, creative directorship for the Queens Museum to raise money. It's actually this Sunday, uh, it's free. I, I plan to go, I think it's gonna be fun. And it's gonna be next to or, or nearby the, the Queens Museum and the, the Unisphere, which is the inspiration behind this, this merchandise. And I just saw this today. And the first that I had as a World's Fair nerd is what a perfect symbol to, it's so much of your work is about understanding. So the, the, the motto for this before 65 World's Fair was peace through understanding. Mm -hmm. And the World's Fair was problematic in a lot of ways, uh, but that I think that message can hold true. And it's interesting that that the Unisphere was reproduced thousands of times on merchandise that people bought at the fair and that proliferate now. And so to kind of reclaim that symbol and and put it on this merchandise to raise money for a nonprofit is it's kind of a very good ending point to think about our discussion about how merchandise can help make change pretty much. But I was hoping maybe to, to close out if you guys had any final question or final comments or if you can speak to the inspiration behind this design, Tremaine. Oh, um, I was just trying to make something dope that I thought people would see and want to wear. Um, and I love the Unisphere and it's like, so many videos, rap videos. So many times my mom brought me to Corona Park. We walk around it. She took me to the museum, the panorama. Also, we go to Hall of Science. So it's just dope to have that design something and like have that on there. Um, and then have like Give Up the Goods on there, which is a legendary Mob Deep song. And flip, because Give Up the Goods, that song's about jokes, stick up kids. And then flip that, flip that, give up the goods as in give charity because y'all you know if you have it give it you know so it's like the jokes is like instead of like running up on someone on the back of the bus and you know rabbit ear in their pockets it's like hey whether you're a kid that likes me buy the thing and give up the goods and give some money to this charity because i'm inspired to work with king's museum because when i came to new york and i met up with sally i saw people through a window, whole people working, feeding hundreds of people a week. You heard Sally say in the beginning, they've fed, they've helped and given food to 32,000 people. That's why I'm working with Queens Museum, nothing else. Um, I've seen them dedicated during the, the middle of COVID, helping people, giving out, pack lunches every day. Um, so that's inspired by them. That's what, you know, and yeah, I just tried to make a fly graphic. Um, I mean, I, knew, I live in Queens. I'll, Unisphere just means Queens now. So, yeah. It's a great you know, but yeah, did, did Unisphere, you have any, Mets any colors, even on, even on the Yankees. Oh, Mets colors, right. you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Hank, did you have any like, kind of final thoughts? Or you went in a lot of different directions. So, no, it's just really great to be here with you all. Um, and um, thank you for inviting me, Tremaine. Um, I can't, uh, yeah, I'm just excited. <laughs> just, and I think the Queen Museum does such critical, important work. Um, and 
has always been kind of, I think, uh, ahead of the rest of the city in many ways in its programming and um, also not only the community programs, but also the exhibitions. Um, and so I'm just excited and uh, I, I want to get that shirt, but I'm sure it'll be sold out before. <laughs> Let me get you one. And I, I, can I just say thank you so much to Hank and Amy for writing that book. Thank you, Ben, because I was doing, I was shooting a, a um, my friend Taylor Page was shooting a film for this collection I was doing in the Queens Museum and I saw the book through the window and the title just memorized me like, whoa, this is a book about the pop-up shop and like art merchandise. And Ben was so kind enough to go in there, open up the shop and give me the book. And, um, you know, it's the first book I read in a while. I've been in a reading slump. And I just wanna thank Sally and every single person at the Queens Museum, everyone that I've met. And, um, you know, my mom would love it if she could see me doing something with um, Queens Museum. So thank you. I appreciate it. I, just, I also just wanted to add, it was such a privilege and an honor to be able to talk to you both about your work. I'm just such a big fan. And if you're there, if either of you or any of you in the chat, or I'll be there on Sunday and I hope you come. It starts at noon. Someone asked that in the, in the chat. But thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Hank. Thank you, Tremaine. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.